The title of our talk is The Response to Libertarianism and Pollution and the Limits of Absolute Moralism. And the, the speaker is Jan Lester. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, about half a page summary of the uh, argument that appeared on the Institute of Economic Affairs blog and then just three and a half pages of um, response to that argument. So, uh, short and sour. Uh, this is an ellipsized quotation summary. I thought I neologized ellipsized. I haven't. It, somebody else has used it before. Anyway, so when I hold, I hold my fingers up like this, I'm not blessing you. That means it's a quotation. Everything here are Zwolinski's words, but not necessarily in the right order. No, they are in the right order, but um, I've, I've mi missed out certain uh, words that didn't seem to add anything, like not and it isn't. Anyway. Some of the currently most popular forms of libertarian thought are defined by a commitment to the non-aggression principle. It is always wrong to initiate physical force against other human beings. In some respects, the non-aggression principle accords nicely with moral common sense. What distinguishes libertarianism from common sense is not the absence, sorry, is not the substance of its moral commitments, but the consistency with which it applies them. But there is one radical implication of non-aggression that poses a potentially devastating problem for the entire moral framework upon which libertarianism rests. Libertarianism seems to imply that environmental pollution is absolutely morally impermissible. And this is an absolutely untenable position. He's right about that. It's the only thing he's right about. Almost everything we do creates physical interference with the persons and property of others. Therefore, almost everything we do is absolutely impermissible. Libertarian intuitions make a certain amount of sense when the problems are those involving discrete interactions between identifiable individuals. But contemporary environmental problems seem to require a very different moral analysis, both less individualistic and less absolutist. The great theoretical problem for libertarians will be how to keep the individualism and absolutism where it makes sense, while simultaneously discarding it where it does not. How shall we maintain that it is wrong to impose a small tax on the wealthy, even if the social benefits would be enormous, while allowing that drivers are entitled to send small amounts of toxins into other people's lungs, since the social benefits of driving are enormous? Any solution that would succeed would ultimately have implications well beyond environmental pollution, pushing libertarians back from the radical absolutist moralism towards the more moderate classical liberalism. I sometimes think that Americans' relation with philosophy is a bit like their relation with uh, irony. They don't quite get it, um, even when you explain it to them. Uh, anyway, um, I might have been being ironic there, but no Americans will ever know. Now, I shall go through this at not much more length. We are first told that some of the currently most popular forms of libertarian thought are defined by a commitment to the non-aggression principle, a principle which holds that it is always wrong to initiate physical force against other human beings. Although popular, this is a poor expression of libertarianism, 
Aggression is problematic as being what libertarians are against. For one thing, it is rarely explained exactly how non-aggression is supposed to relate to a theory of interpersonal liberty. For another, non-aggression in plain English is no more up to the task than non-coercion, another libertarian favourite, although less popular of late. Not without charitable interpretation, at least. As glossed in the previous quotation, aggression clearly does not work for two main reasons. First, theft and fraud don't need to involve anyone having to initiate physical force against other human beings. You do not need to initiate physical force against me in order to steal my money or to cheat me out of it. Second, consequently, it will sometimes be necessary to initiate physical force against thieves and fraudsters to arrest them and bring them to trial, for instance. That said, we can try to make a little more sense of the non-aggression principle, or NAP. Partly because many libertarians use it and partly in order to move towards something clearer. Therefore, we might, as above suggested, provide a charitable interpretation of aggression. For instance, the proactive interference with the bodies and external property of other people where that property is itself is not acquired by proactive interference. And if we do that, then it begins to make sense that the absence of such aggression is what interpersonal liberty is, though this sets aside various precise philosophical problems with this account. For such aggression against us would be other people initiating constraints on us, and we can then make sense of interpersonal liberty as the absence of such initiated constraints. However, it ought at least to be mentioned that what liberty is as a theory and as social phenomena is a factual matter that is completely separate from the moral issue of whether breaching such liberty is always wrong. Conflating the two issues, as the article does, is a major source of confusion. Having rectified that account of the non-aggression principle sufficiently for our current purposes, we can now proceed to the second major error in the article. The problem is that libertarianism seems to imply that environmental pollution, insofar as it constitutes or involves aggression against other human beings, is morally impermissible. Not just a bad thing, mind you, but absolutely morally impermissible in the same way that theft, assault and murder are. The error here is easily explained. The non-aggression principle, as interpreted here at least, and the uh, explanation I gave of it may sound rather Rothbardian, but there's an important difference in the way uh, I actually uh, made it precise, uh, is best seen, the non-aggression principle is best seen as being what observing liberty fully or absolutely would require. That is, full liberty is the absence of any aggression, i.e. proactive interference with people and their non-proactively interfering property. Now, it is true that pollution will be aggressive in this sense, but that is only half of the story, because to prohibit the activities that are causing the pollution will also be aggressive. Consider a simple example. If I have a fire for warmth and cooking, then you might suffer some minor pollution as a result. But if you can force me not to have a fire by some means, then you have deprived me of warmth and cooking. Both the allowance and the prohibition of pollution will be aggression. Whichever one is preferred, or however they are balanced, there will be some aggression. Therefore, it is impossible to implement the non-aggression principle in the event of such clashes. So what is the libertarian solution? It is surely libertarian to maximise liberty as far as is practical. That means adopting a minimum aggression principle or MAP in the event of such clashes. And that probably involves compromise and possibly compensation. How are minimum aggressions to be determined? 
They can often best be measured, traded and compensated for by assigning market or at least reasonable monetary values to the gains and losses involved. In any event, the general solution to the problem is to see the non-aggression principle as referring to observing liberty when matters are one-sided, but the minimum aggression principle applies when there are clashes. Note that this profit solution is not, as the article suggests, restricted to discrete interactions between identifiable individuals. It applies just as much to a world increasingly characterised by the complexly interrelated activities of large numbers of dispersed individuals. But to engage in, say, class actions, as the legal term has it, over contemporary environmental problems such as automobile pollution, acid rain and global climate change is not in any anti-libertarian sense to be less individualistic in identifying perpetrators and victims. However, there is an important equivocation here. In one sense, rules that are intended to protect the general public rather than individuals in particular are thereby, ipso facto, not individualistic. I've lost my water now. <laughs> but they can remain individualistic in the libertarian sense that is opposed to collectivism. Cheers whereby individuals cease to have claims uh, to liberty because of the greater good of the majority. So individualism in principle is not abandoned just because there are a lot of indeterminate people involved. Neither is the minimum aggression principle in principle less absolutist. This is because liberty remains the thing that must absolutely be maximized. Consequently, it is clearly possible to keep the individualism and absolutism where it makes sense because, as interpreted here, it makes sense everywhere. Then we are asked this question. How can libertarians still maintain that it is wrong to impose a small tax on the wealthy even if the social benefits would be enormous? while allowing that drivers are entitled to send small amounts of toxins into other people's lungs, since, after all, the social benefits of driving are enormous. This question is confused in two main ways. First, no libertarian need, need concede that it is even practical to impose a small tax on the wealthy such that the social benefits would be enormous. This mere logical possibility flies in the face of the deleterious unintended consequences of tax transfers. In an imaginary world, the state might well be a welfare boon. In reality, it is a welfare bane. There is no sound reason to suppose that utilitarianism must, in practice, countenance violations of individual rights, as the article assumes. Second, it is at best a muddle to describe the libertarian case for allowing the toxins caused by driving as being because the social benefits are enormous. It is again necessary to look at both sides before applying the minimum aggression principle. On the first side, allowing driving despite its toxins. This will proactively impose aggress to a minuscule degree on people, probably too small to make compensation claims economic in most cases. And this has to include a deduction to the extent that any particular individuals also engage in driving or benefit from the consequences of driving such as the delivery of goods to their area, etc., or choose to move into an area where driving is allowed, etc. Second, banning driving because of its toxins. This would proactively impose huge costs in one way or another on almost everyone. Hence, one is the liberty maximising option. 
If the foregoing analysis is roughly correct, then the answer is not waiting to be discovered by future libertarian philosophers, and it is more mere fantasy and confusion to suppose that any solution must ultimately mean pushing libertarians back towards the more moderate classical liberalism of Adam Smith, David Hume, and Friedrich Hayek. Clarificatory conclusion. Because of the way that the problem was originally framed, it is easy to misinterpret the uh, foregoing response. In particular, it might look as though it amounts to a moral advocacy of a sort of consequentialist libertarianism to replace deontological libertarianism. It does not, and such an interpretation would be to miss the crucial main point in a typical way, for the response is not really about libertarian morals. It is about what interpersonal liberty is in abstract theory and what applying it objectively entails in normal practice. Most self-identified libertarians unwittingly have a moral muddle without a central factual theory of liberty. They cannot yet see that they first need to sort out what liberty is and therefore entails if instantiated and only after that can moral questions about it be coherently raised and tackled. An analogical error would be utilitarians who could not even give an account of utility. And that is the central problem with modern libertarianism, as, as I see it. They can't even tell you what uh, liberty is. And all of the problems radiate out from that. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, was it the company yes. ones? Do you think, um, in terms of where you were saying waste and benefits sort of um, impositions and um, liberty between two individuals, um, so do you think that so who was there first comes into yeah. the talk? So basically, the difference between moving next to a more noisy nightclub and worrying about the noise, and then a lovely serene neighbourhood, and then someone builds a nightclub there, do you think that sort of comes into play? It's a factor, yes. Uh, 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 but uh, I would explain that factor. Um, I mean, well, there's a very long explanation, but um, uh, it's partly a question of who's been more of a nuisance to who, and uh, you know, you're moving into the area, whether you're the person who doesn't want the nightclub or you're bringing the nightclub in, you know, you're the you're the new factor, right. and um, but then there could be background rules concerning what can and can't be done on all of the problem, in which case that might overrule yeah. anything. So these things are not normally in a vacuum. Uh, they're usually in a framework of fairly well uh, recognized um, property rights, yeah. and that's how we, we tell. But uh, sometimes they aren't. Uh, uh, sometimes we get genuinely novel problems, and sometimes, uh, and I would, but I would expect that to come up as a, as a consideration man next door gets a pig or a rooster or something and in, in, in central London I mean you know makes you have every it'd be ridiculous yes uh, I have two related questions so uh, Popper has this idea that um, um, uh, there's a common error of thinking that you have to begin every debate with Definitions, and he thinks that that kind of drags people into this sort of essentialist hole of yeah. you know trying to give a, a sort of ultimate definition of a concept. Yeah. So, what do you think of that idea? And uh, relatedly, do you not think that uh, the problem with Swalinski's article is just that he misses the fact that there are clashes, and therefore you have to have a minimising approach instead of a, uh, an right. NAP approach? Uh, so, um, uh, very uh, okay. First things first. Then. Um, the because uh, if you use a word that not other other people don't understand, you might need to define it. Or if you want to have a stipulative definition for uh, the purposes of some proof, you, then you might need. But generally speaking, uh, what you often need is a theory 
and a theory is not to be confused with a definition and the definition is about how words are used and the theory is about what the world is like so uh, I'm often told that I have a definition of liberty I say it's not a definition of liberty it's a theory of interpersonal liberty that, that, that this is uh, that I think corresponds to what interpersonal liberty is and therefore I can deduce consequences it's a bit like the difference between the definition of the moon as the earth satellite and a theory about what that thing that goes around the planet is. If this Definitions are not theories, but they can look like it. And I've even seen philosophers insist that uh, some theories are definitions. I don't know why. Uh, on the, uh, so that was the Popperian point. So I, I mean, I'm inclined to go along with Popper there. Um, uh, and the other one was, uh, yes, um, he doesn't see the clash, uh, even though it's been pointed out to him. He's completely ignored it. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, I... You think that you, if, if there isn't a clash, if that's a mistake, you could easily explain it, but no, he hasn't. He's actually written a much, much longer uh, uh, chapter in a book, which this article in the, uh, uh, on the blog of the Institute of Economic Affairs, it sort of captures the central points and the, uh, the, the 10,000 word chapter, which I just happened to read before I came out, is I mean more it's based on the same assumptions so it's completely wrong-headed for that reason but uh, you can see why I wouldn't want to abandon that as just as it's about to come out as a book maybe I don't know I mean I, I, I don't think it really matters you can just say well I've moved on now but publish it anyway uh, yes I think that's the that that is a uh, that's a that is one crucial failure I don't know whether I put my finger on and say that is the only thing because but what Swalinski does is he um, he sees the problems with orthodox libertarianism conflating liberty, property, and morals. Um, but his solution is to say, well, they are is libertarianism is hopeless. Let's go back to classical liberalism because that's what he wants. All he always wants to get back to classical liberalism. Uh, uh, we can have his bleeding heart on his bloody sleeve, which is his bleeding heart libertarian website. He thinks that's, you know, it's uh, extreme libertarians are a bit nasty and he, he'd like to get away from that if possible, as far as I can see. Uh, uh, speaking as a bleeding heart libertarian of a different kind, yeah. uh, the whole reason for engaging all this, apart from the fun of it, possibly, some of the logical puzzles and the historical yeah. clashes, is that you're actually concerned about other people, human yeah. misery and human suffering and human well-being and, yeah. and injustice and cruelty and, and the rest of it. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean you have to go back to classical liberalism. Yeah. It can motivate you to, well, first of all, find what the truth is, as far as you know. Yeah. And that, you hope, will coincide with roots or means for having a less miserable society as a consequence. I, I can't see what, what the problem is. Myself, as you probably know, for many yeah. years, the animal so occasionally bantered at five year intervals about um, what's going on here. And I've been an opportun opportunitarian, as it were, so not a utilitarian. Then. I, I'm concerned about opportunities, valued opportunities for people, and how you get them. What sort of institutions do you have? Of course, you have private property, security, and that, the rest of it. Yeah. So it's not so much I'm concerned with um, aggression or the non-aggression thing. After all, you're entitled to aggress against, against someone who's about to um, come and murder you and your family. Yeah. I, I, I suppose you would allow that. Kind of thing. Of course. Yeah. So I, I have no problem there. But I, uh, but as for the rules, the rules of institutions, I'm concerned about not so much the preservation of liberty as the maximising of opportunity. But guess what? It comes to the same thing. Pretty much. If you have no violations of liberty, then you pretty much have the maximising of opportunities. Other things we get. Yeah, I would. Um, I'd be reluctant to get into a list of reasons that liberty is good, just because that begins to look like an attempt to justify its existence. Rather, I would always say my conjecture is that. Um, Liberty is perfectly adequate, and we don't need political interference with it. Tell me why I'm wrong. 
Um, and I can give, I could give some sort of rough explanation. I could explain the free market a bit and why people are better off learning from their own mistakes and the moral hazards and there are all sorts of other things. But that, again, as soon as you start doing that, you get into a potentially uh, indefinitely long list and it, it just cuts to the quick to, to, to say to somebody, you tell me why we uh, can't um, abolish the state and have anarchy, uh, which almost universally people, uh, by the way, use anarchy when they mean anomy, no rules. Uh, uh, that's not going to change in a hurry. So, we should be, but it's worth pointing it out to them that we are not anomists, and anomy is what they're complaining about. We actually want laws, anarchists. The arrived at the protect people and property. Is there anyone else? Most people don't understand what anarchy is. They hear anarchy all the time. And it's easy to pronounce people as anarchists. Uh, but if you yeah. pronounce people as animists, then they go. <laughs> it doesn't happen, does it? Yeah. You animist. Yeah, exactly. They're not quite sure. An animist? Is, yeah. Someone from anonymous. Yeah, yeah, right. or a spirit, spiritualist, anime, animist. Oh, you're praising or condemning, would you say? Mm. That's what they would think. Yeah. Are you bragging or complaining? Especially for <laughs> our generation, uh, anime had even, even more strong. Um, so, so, like, I was talking to my grandfather about this recently, he was talking about when like, evisceration, well, an anarchist was basically just used as a catch all for terrorists, basically. Yeah. So, um, it's, if that's the starting point, yeah. how do you imagine someone, you know, throwing a uh, well, petrol? I mean, it's worse than that at the moment. This this uh, attack on extremism, which is just crazy. Yeah. Excellence is extreme. Yeah. If somebody is a straight A student, that's a bit extreme. So they need to be investigated by the police. Uh, if you want to get rid of um, politics, I suppose that makes you libertarians extremists. But we don't advocate any violence at all. So it means that they can investigate and arrest anybody that uh, that they regard as. Is extreme, but it does, the, the word doesn't really have any content. Uh, but ju just pick and choose, which is very Stalin esque, you know. Extremism is just consistency, really. Uh, it always, how could, as such, extremism cannot be. I can understand. The war on terrorism was a fairly silly idea, abstraction, but the war on extremism. That's even scary. You've been going around being excellent, and excellence is an extreme. You're therefore you mean if you're in trouble, extreme. They they mean something like. I think they mean something like the violence. Tradition. No, they mean something like tradition that there's someone. Everything traditional is middle of the road. Oh yeah. If you're coming out with the extreme, you're coming out with something. In fact, they even actually said as a democratic. democratic, and by then, okay, so then I am an extremist because I don't believe in democracy. Right. So then, then I am an extreme. But uh, if. <laughs> It's, it's a very seems a very slippery slope well, to uh, well, arresting terrible. and investigating people who are completely and utterly peaceful. Are these people moderately opposed to peaceful or extremely ah. opposed to peaceful? <laughs> Don't expect them to be consistent. They're above the law. The, th the thing is, to study anything, you've got to study. It's opposite of you. In order to study democracy, you've got to question whether democracy is is uh, viable or not, or yes. good or not. And, and again, with anarchy or anything else. You have to discuss the, the negative side of it, which is why it's very bad to have a blanket term of banning anyone who's against democracy. Uh, you know, in order to be democratic, you need to allow them to continue. Is there anyone else? Uh, the word libertarian must be too big at the definitions. I mean, it can be a libertarian and a utilitarian of a kind, I think. It doesn't have to mean that you are a, it's simply the non-aggression principle. Uh, you can be a utilitarian, uh, a libertarian in the sense you could say I'm a, uh, you could say you're a, a libertarian for utilitarian re re reasons. You should, I'm, I've always been I, I, uh, a utilitarian, but when I discovered that libertarianism gave people more utility, I adopted it. But I've never stopped being a utilitarian, you could say that. Uh, and and uh, when I sort of started out, I was sympathetic to that line of thought but then um, sort of David persuaded me obviously if you don't have any foundations you don't need to explain it in terms of anything so Americans libertarians are constantly going on about 
the, you know, the basis of uh, libertarianism. It doesn't have a basis. It's a conjecture that liberty is a good thing. Uh, and uh, why isn't it? You don't, uh, you don't have to justify it in terms of flourishing, human flourishing, or utility, or, or anything. It, it's, it's sufficient, but there's no uh, good criticism of it that uh, it, it uh, remains a conjecture for refutation, if anybody can manage it. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, I think it's quite easy to justify, actually. Whenever anyone asks me to justify my beliefs, I just state that uh, the more freedom that you have, the more responsible you are as an individual. It's the best possible individuals. I would say that I would call such a thing a, a, an explanation a, a, and uh, I would say it's a very precise and partial explanation and it might not deal with what their worry is in the sense that they may completely agree with what you say but say uh, their criticism of libertarianism is that it leads to global warming or something else and they and they can accept what you say so uh, I would always distinguish um, an explanation from a justification because the idea of a justification seems to be that you know this is the thing that's at, at the bottom of it uh, that uh, is um, everybody ought to believe and if they only believe this then they'd be libertarians but it, uh, it, I don't think there is anything at the bottom that, uh, that can support libertarianism because it's assumptions all the way down and uh, I'm very happy for people to be libertarians for diverse reasons you know it's whatever whatever they like about libertarianism that's good enough for me I don't want to say no 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 you should believe it for these reasons you shouldn't believe it for those reasons why, why not uh, so but there's nothing wrong with saying what I mean, if somebody hasn't got a clue what libertarianism is, you've got to say a few things about, you know, what, what it is and how it works. I, I would rather say those are conjectural explanations, like the, how the free market tends to operate efficiently if, if left to itself, it's self-regulating, because it would include private policing, uh, torts, and so forth. Uh, I, I, but but uh, very quickly, uh, if you get back to the person that you're dealing with, uh, because usually they have in mind a criticism, and any attempt to explain something just might not meet whatever it is their criticism is about. So you may as well ask them what that is. Is there anyone else who is going to? Going by Yeah, well, I mean, uh, if we're going to go back to uh, fundamentals, um, then um, I would say that we derive self-ownership uh, as a, uh, a way of minimising clashes between people and, and there's an element of uh, interpersonal comparisons of utility or disutility here, which I think is ultimately unavoidable. <coughs> if you want people, I mean, it might be very convenient for me to have you as my slave, and it might be very inconvenient for you to be my slave. It's probably more inconvenient for you than it is convenient for me, and vice versa. I would very much not like to be your slave. Therefore, we, uh, we minimize the proactive constraints by saying, well, self-ownership seems to be the best way to have people not. But it is, in a sense, yes, the fact that I can't simply take somebody as a slave is a bit of a nuisance to me, but it would be even more of a nuisance if somebody could take me as a slave. So in order to minimise the proactive constraints, self-ownership is derivable from the pure theory of liberty as the minimisation of uh, uh, proactive constraints on people. It's not as most uh, orthodox lib libertarianism have, has it, um, the fundamental assumption 
self-ownership is derived from liberty. Uh, uh, you've got to put in a bit about property there as well. To, but I mean, self-control as such is derived from liberty, but then if you're going to have self-control, how is it going to be protected? Well, we're, going it, we're going to call it property rather than just self-control. But in a sense, for, if people objectively have control over themselves and not over other people, then that minimizes the proactive impositions that people have upon each other. So uh, uh, th that's how you get your self-ownership. You can do the same thing with physical property. I'd like to be able to just walk through your house or maybe occupy your house and take it, but I mean, I wouldn't like it if somebody could just take my house away from me. Therefore, private property is a way of minimizing the, the extent to which we are nuisances to each other. It's a solution to, to the problem. That, and again, it's derivable. Now, it's derivable first that people have control of themselves, which we then later call ownership and respect. And uh, ownership comes later, but the mere objective control of themselves, also objective control of uh, physical things that they've invested in and are using and so forth. and. Later we say, okay, we'll morally and legally turn that into property. But, but the, the, the uh, uh, objective deduction is not um, actually a moral or a legal one, which is why I always insist we have to, do, if, if you want to be clear, you have to do the two things that, that, that Rothbardianism doesn't do. And by Rothbardianism, I would also include no, Nozickianism because Nozick simply really accepted what Rothbard said. He didn't uh, sort of question radically. He, he, he had some very sophisticated arguments, but uh, within a Rothbardian framework. The Rothbardian line since about the 60s is freedom equals a certain kind of legitimate property. And so freedom property and legitimacy, or whether, whether, whether moral, moral or legal, are all sort of bound together, and you can't pull them apart and examine them separately. That's a big, big problem. Less of a problem is justificationism, that, that, that uh, Rothbard and so forth think that their views are completely justified, and that to read the justification is to see that they are right. Uh, and uh, you know they don't need to listen to your criticisms. You have to understand their justification. So, and of course, knows it was a justificationist as well. And uh, in, in that sense, I just I don't I would just classify Nozick as a, as a Rothbardian. And Rothbardianism is the philosophically confused position that I think we need to move beyond, uh, because you see the same problems cropping up again and again and again, both within. The, uh, the movement by people who hold these assumptions, but also out, uh, outside critics, with the acceptance of a few sort of cult members who are very happy to insist there's an absolutely nothing wrong here. Uh, no, liberty is property, is legitimate property, and that's that. There's no confusion, there's nothing to worry about. I don't know what you're talking about. Can't we just get on with real concrete issues? But then these people don't really, they're not really interested in the philosophy. And if they're not, they're not. But uh, they're never going to convince uh, somebody who has a philosophical criticism by trying to bluster their way, saying, well, this is just not practical. Philosophical criticisms do have practical import, just in the same way that theories in physics might, in the long run, have practical import, though you might not yet see what those are. Is it possible to be a kind of um, thoroughgoing Sternerite here and say, um, I want this kind of world? Yeah. I see these institutions are going to bring it about. Yeah. yeah. Bang on. That's it. No morals. You can be a completely self interested libertarian, so I don't care about other people. The reason I like libertarianism is I get a lot more. Well, of you might care about other people, but that's what you care about. It's you. Well, I mean, you, you, know, I mean, you, I mean, you could. Yeah, that's, said, that's more like Hobbes. You could be. You could be um, uh, uh, a psychopathic libertarian. I mean, you just generally just thought, no, libertarian society is full of goodies. That's the society for me. And I advocate it on that basis. And that's why there, I say there is no one thing 
you know, you know, we, we, it's sufficient that libertarians agree, roughly, that libertarian society is what we want. We don't need to ask them why, that, what, you know, what, you know, maximum stamp collecting, because that's what really interests, whatever it is that interests them, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Uh, and they, they might be doing it for uh, quite altruistic reasons, or they're purely self-interested, or most people are a bit of both. But yes, they could have very, some very strange reasons, and uh, I'm sure some do. <laughs> yes? Uh, one criticism I hear a lot about uh, libertarianism is that uh, basically it doesn't address the, the, the problem of pollution. So not this argument, which mm. is the first time I hear that, that it will just uh, prevent the polluting, but rather than the free market doesn't uh, address the externalities that were, like pollution, for example, that just could happen over like 50 years. And that's just, you know, you cannot really factor that in, in, in the free market as it currently is. Or when there is a time lag, when we're talking about clashes, basically, if there is a time lag, yeah. the clashes, I don't know, I could think about, you know, a builder would use asbestos and it's cheaper for yeah. cheaper for you, but then in 20 years' time, you, you might just get sick. Well, originally people didn't know that asbestos no, had know. those qualities. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, the thing is, um, a lot of the criticisms of the way that the market pollutes and doesn't internalise externalities uh, are criticisms within the framework of state rules and state laws and state courts. Whilst if you had private courts, I think they're much more likely to be sensitive to these things. There will be people going around, you know, looking for class actions, looking to the long term, you know, um, to try and sue on behalf of people because, you know, that's, there'd be money in it for them. Uh, and they, they don't need to persuade an awful lot of people to, you know, pass a law very, very complicated, you know, they can just simply go to court and say, look, a long-run consequence of this is these people are going to be, uh, you know, uh, damaged uh, without their consent in these various ways, and therefore they, they should have a right to sue. And the court, if it's a libertarian culture, uh, then the court will be a libertarian court, and they'd say, okay, yes, let's, you know, that's a point with... You know, that, that's going to be at least allowable as a court case. What, what the consequences are when you hear arguments and counter-arguments, I don't know. And of course, there's always such a thing as an economic amount of pollution, and there's such a thing as um, de minimis non curat lex. The, uh, it, it might well be that other people are harmed, but they're harmed so little, really in terms of the damage done to them that it's not worth having the court case over and that sort of thing. You've partly covered that point, only partly. In the 19th century, it's, uh, it's certainly the late 19th century, even up to 1956, eight, uh, there were terrible smogs. Yes. And they carried off people with lung problems. 56, I think. Old folk. I saw one of the last one. Yeah. Well, you couldn't see much. That's <laughs> <laughs> see the smog. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the use of fossil fuels in the 19th, 18th, 17th, 18th, 19th century created far more people than they otherwise have lived. So, uh, what's, uh, yeah. what's, well, I, what's what, what, I, what I read about this was that um, they, uh, so a sort of so class action, life, a class action was tried, but the parliament decided it was in the interest of uh, industry and the common good uh, to allow this pollution to take place wrongly, I think, but actually the, the state there was actually imposing the... Do you think so? That's, my, that's what I recall reading, I can't give you a reference, but uh, that actually that, that somebody, that people had tried to bring class actions against the pollution and Parliament actually said no, it's in uh, So they actually imposed it on people. Well, no. well there's pollution and pollution, because if it's making more happy humans, they're dying a bit before their time, in a sense. Yeah. But they wouldn't have existed at all at any time. Yeah, there is. If they hadn't been the yeah. So. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, which is why it's. There will be complicated court cases, and uh, often there maybe there'll be 
the answers will be specific to a particular area and say, well, okay, I said, we're going to do it here. If you don't like it, you have to move. Because that's the decision that we've reached. Uh, but there's going to be a lot more uh, uh, precision and subtlety in law, I think, in a libertarian culture. There are the, I mean, the state is a great ham-fisted thing. One rule from Land's End to John O'Groats, that's it. You know, and, and, and we're not going to have any more legislation on this for decades. Whilst uh, a, a culture of law, libertarian law, protecting people and their property is going to be quick to come in and spot problems and try to come up with solutions and, uh, if possible, without, you know, having any big court case, you know, sufficient that the, I mean, you'd want to settle out of course if you possibly could, just get it over with, it'd be a lot cheaper. So I'm, you know, uh, on this you can read, uh, who's that well-known guy, the American guy who writes all the books on law? Oh, him, uh, yeah. Benson. Benson. Bruce, Benson. Bruce, Bruce Benson. Bruce Benson. He's written a lot on libertarian law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, Freeman has also written a lot on law. Has of gone from being a professor, David Freeman, being a professor of economics to being a professor of economics and law. Yeah. <laughs> so he's he's done, enough, uh, of course. Yeah. But yes, certainly. So, in your what's the closest we've come to a libertarian culture? Um, well, I mean, the. the well, no, the, the examples that people often cite in the literature are um, uh, Ireland and Iceland and some... North or South? The whole, uh, the whole think, thing at one stage, is I it? I think Rothbard's confused about Ireland. Uh, uh, and, uh, <coughs> uh, and certain parts of uh, Africa where they had stateless, and maybe even South America, I seem to recall, sort of stateless societies. and. Well, there's uh, a rumor uh, of China as well, of course. The Tao, that, that book that opened corporate. Dao. 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 Yeah. Yeah. T pronounced D. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's uh, ultimately, I think you it, uh, libertarians have to admit when they're accused, there's never been a society without you know without a, a sustained society with really without any government. So that we have, to, I think we ought to admit that's true, and there's never been a society without uh, disease either. But is that a reason why we need these things? We shouldn't try to resist them and get rid of them if we can. Uh, it's a, you know, it's, uh, they sort of see the the existence as somehow necessary. Mind you, some people think you, you need disease to get rid of the surplus population. Or yeah. Oh no, sorry. It's got to be useful for something. Yeah. <laughs> it's getting. You don't know what it is yet. It's getting easier for me as well. Oh, well I've done yeah. This yeah. Um, good good idea. Andy. Good idea. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any any more points? Um, any? Just a point of information. Oh. You mentioned Iceland. What period in history are you talking? Uh, no, no, no. During the sagas. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> hundreds of years. Iceland. Iceland. Yeah, the sagas, they come sagas, from Iceland, yes, don't they? They don't come from Ireland. Sagas don't, don't come from Ireland. Somebody here said North or South. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. yeah, you said North or South. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, uh, there, I mean, there are arguments. If, if you, um, I've read a bit about it. I've read what um, David Friedman and some people have said about it. And uh, I, but I just don't think it's really worth getting into too much unless you're interested in the history of it, because you don't need to prove that something has existed in order th th uh, that it can exist or that it should exist. It's sort of irrelevant. New things happen. Uh, you know, yeah, there was a time when you could say, if you go back far enough in history, look, every society has slavery or every society has cannibalism. If you go, I mean, it looks like human beings were cannibals at one stage and that was just normal. After you kill your enemy, you eat him. Why would you let them, you know? But we've moved on a bit since then. <laughs> I hope, yeah. Mm. Well, I, Thank you. That's, better. That's better than cannibalism, yeah.
what I was coming out tonight, so someone asked me about well, libertarianism. What, um, where does that come from? What, uh, you know, what, what kind of economics is it? Or what, what, what person can you point me to? What's it all about? Rothbard is the, mo is the modern person who's, I mean, there are others, but I would say Rothbard, first and foremost, is the major spokesman for it. Yeah, well, what do you make of the, the, the term anarchic capitalism? Because I, I kind of like it more than the anarchist one, because anarchy, lots of people refer to societies without state yeah. that have worked on a tribal basis, and I'm not against tribalistic societies, I, don't, I just don't think they're very successful. And what you are saying, we've never seen a society like a libertarian society, has a lot to do with that modern capitalism where you have companies, like, like yeah. specific entities, um, uh, working on the basis of, of profit, don't exist that long in, 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 this, in, the, in the sense that we see them today yeah. as, as an independent entity. Yeah. I think if these companies are running societies, that is crucial to, for, for anarchy to be really successful, uh, otherwise we will go back to some kind of tribalistic society that will then be very vulnerable. They, they have they have a tendency to work inside, but they are very vulnerable to being conquered yeah. from outside because within these tribalistic societies you cannot really create much wealth and, and can I mean I my having thought about this a bit, my preference is to say I'm a private property anarchist, but actually I'm a libertarian first and I derive private property from liberty and what you know, but if just to give people a quick picture, and, and I say, and therefore, by private property, many people will find it very, very useful to have uh, big business doing lots of useful things. But if you all want to go and live on a commune, uh, uh, you can. Uh, there's, no, there's, there's nothing inherently capitalistic about libertarianism. You can have anarcho you can have anarcho communism on a yeah, well, basis. In theory, but, but practically, I mean if everyone were living like the Amish and there is still a society that doesn't, they would be very vulnerable from being conquered on what yeah, uh, uh, yeah but if it were um, if it were a libertarian culture that underpinned these things, then why would they want to conquer them? I mean you in in America they've got all these groups and I've you know even seen some of them. And uh, of course, they could be crushed, but and but why? why? What's the point? I just yeah, well, leave them alone. That, that assumes that there is a, there is a, a kind of a capitalist society around it. Not everyone lives like the English. If everyone lives like the English, would, the whole continent would look very vulnerable, and then maybe people would come from from outside who are not libertarians and, and would crush it. Otherwise, maybe we just need to. Have a world revolution, and then as long as not everyone on the planet is a libertarian. Well, yeah, yeah, well, now you're getting into the big issue of uh, so-called national defence, and do is that one of the small areas where where you need a state? No, uh, need uh, given that other states exist, yeah. given that other states exist, do you need one? I mean, I uh, I don't think I, so. I, I, don't, I, I wonder whether it, it, it's you can have, have have it done by companies, you know. Yeah, you can just have nuclear, nuclear companies in defence. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, and volunteer. Well, that's the thing. So. If 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 a society is wealthy enough, yeah, they they have enough left over to buy weapons on the side, yeah. and, and and will have much more of those than any non-libertarian, non-capitalistic society on, on the side. So I think the big advantage in defence for for libertarianism is capitalism and capitalism producing a lot of, of wealth, and then this wealth can easily be used to build up some defence. Except, except that most of this wealth isn't used to build up defence, it's used to attack other people. That's well, in, in our, in our state it's is a state, to war. But, uh, uh, but, um, but that is a state, state problem. I mean, a private company wouldn't just go around no. nation-building people, because well, that is way too expensive. And, yeah. But, um, but people would be armed, probably. Yeah. Would be well okay, armed. you're not supposing. Okay, you're not supposing uh, the existence of a, a state. You're just saying we need to be rich enough to be able to protect ourselves. I, 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 I say that if there is a libertarian society within a world where there still are states, yeah, I don't see much of a problem defending that 
that if, if they are aware of the problem that there are other states, which there probably will be, and they, they take mm. action to, to basically um, yeah. prepare themselves to be, to defend yeah. themselves. Well, this is, okay, but this is getting way off, you know, pollution yeah. Yeah. and... Uh, <laughs> okay. um, well, yeah. invasion, it's not the invasion of armies, there's a kind of pollution, but uh, on the non-pollution front, uh, that's correct, but there, there would be a time period by which a, a poorer libertarian society is not quite as rich or as well armed as an interventionist. So the idea that that in itself, it's the best option, but you know, there is a period when you're growing sufficiently well to have yeah. an, an instant army. And yet North Korea has nuclear yeah. weapons on this, not a wonderful <laughs> capitalistic product. Yeah, but they're not really, I mean, they could, could uh, create some some damage where, by by with a, with a huge army, but as soon as they were attacking someone, I think this whole thing would implode because then people would see that there's this outside world that is much better than the yeah. loyalty. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, what I mean is, you can have powerful weapons without uh, having. You can have an awful lot of poverty in your country and tax people and still maintain power. So, you know, oh um, yeah, but can you? Can you be more powerful than a free society that has much more resources than you? I doubt that. Uh, not, probably not in the long run. Yeah. But yeah, again, yes, it's only recently free. But again, so if, if unless we've got anything more on pollution or. Sure. Is there any, any more to speak? I think that's it. Oh, thank you very much indeed for coming then. Thank you. Uh, thank you.